Uh, his most recent book, Newman on Vatican II, investigates how Newman would have understood the Second Vatican Council. Father Carr is also the author of The Catholic Revival in English Literature, 1845 to 1961, Mere Catholicism, and G.K. Chesterton, a biography. For the past seven years, he's taught a summer seminar at Oxford for graduate students on Newman's thought from the Newman Christie Institute. And tonight, he will speak about <coughs> Newman's apologetics of the imagination. Please help me right now to welcome him. Well, in his um, standard history of apologetics, the late Cardinal Avery Dulles uh, calls Newman the leading Catholic apologist of the 19th century and one of the greatest of all times. In this discussion of Newman, as in the rest of his book, Dulles is concerned only with the intellectual, that is, the philosophical and theological arguments that Newman deploys. And certainly, when one thinks of Newman as an apologist, one immediately thinks of the three works that Dulles discusses. His essay in aid of a grammar of assent, with its famous argument uh, for the existence of God from conscience. His essay on the development of Christian doctrine, which argues that the Roman Catholic Church is the heir to the primitive church. And his Apologia Pro Vita Sua, his theological autobiography, <coughs> in which he recounts the theological developments that led him to Rome, a kind of parallel text to the essay on development of Christian doctrine. But Newman was also a persuasive apologist of the imagination as well as the intellect, a distinction that the author of the Apologia well understood, as can easily be seen by comparing what he tells us in the Apologia with what he does not tell us. Newman's model in writing the book was another theological autobiography. I, know, I was reading some the other day called a spiritual autobiography. It's not a spiritual autobiography. We don't hear anything about Newman's spiritual life. It's a theological autobiography about the development of his theological views. Uh, uh, sorry, the model was the uh, for, the model of his writing the book was the Force of Truth, published in 1779, in which Thomas Scott, to whom Newman acknowledges his debt, recounted his conversion from Unitarianism to Trinitarian Christianity in strictly intellectual terms, avoiding the personal and experiential factors involved. Similarly, Newman's autobiography restricts itself almost entirely to his strictly theological development. Like Scott, Newman was anxious <coughs> to present the objective, an objective, as objective an account as possible and to avoid any appearance of being influenced by subjective factors. And yet we know that consequently he does not in fact tell the full story of his gradual deconversion from Anglicanism and conversion to Catholicism. Most important of all, he is almost silent about the effect on his imagination of his momentous Mediterranean cruise of 1832 to 1833, immediately prior to the formal beginning of the Oxford or Tractarian movement. His visits to Malta, Corfu, and especially Roman Sicily are passed over in six paragraphs, whereas the letters and poems he wrote on his travels, as well as the extraordinarily vivid account he later wrote of his near fatal illness in Sicily, show how crucial this time of intense experiences was for his subsequent religious development. Indeed, in the next chapter of the Apologia, he admits that the sight of so many great places, venerable shrines, and, and noble churches much impressed my imagination. His heart was touched also, he recalled, by Catholic devotions and worship. Now, although his reason was not affected at all, for his judgment was against her when viewed as an, when viewed as an institution, as truly as it had ever been, nevertheless, he learned to have tender feelings towards her, even though his imagination was still stained, that's the word he uses, stained, by his early evangelical conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist. So it is surely undeniable that the imaginative seeds of Newman's eventual conversion to Rome were sown during his travels in southern Europe, when he experienced Catholicism for the first time at first hand, because very few Catholics in England at the time, the only time he'd been in the Catholic Church when he was a boy, uh, to the Assumption of Warwick Street, which was the chapel of the Bavarian Embassy. His father took him there for a musical concert. It was not, in fact, till the fateful summer 
1839, that for the first time a doubt came upon Newman of the terribleness of Anglicanism. He was studying the history of the Monophysite heresy when he suddenly seemed to see, I quote him, Christendom of the 16th and 19th centuries reflected. I saw my face in that mirror, and I was a Monophysite. <laughs> <I'll take> that. <clears throat> he thought that he had seen a deeply disturbing analogy, an, an awful similitude, after the Council of Chalcedon, which upheld the doctrine of Pope Leo, that Christ was not only of, but in two natures, the adherents of the Monophysite heresy broke into two parties, the extremists being called the Eutychians. What so forcibly struck Newman was that the moderate, moderate Monophysites, in effect, occupied a via media, or middle way, neither accepting the teaching of the Pope that was upheld by the Council, nor adopting the extreme position of the Eutychians. In other words, the moderate Monophysites <coughs> looked disturbingly like Tractarian Anglicans, such as Newman, who saw themselves as occupying a via media, or middle way, between Rome and Geneva. Now, analogies have to be seen by the imagination. They are not the conclusion of theological reasoning. Newman did not immediately become a Catholic. It had undoubtedly seen, as he put it, a ghost, even if eventually the vivid impression upon his imagination faded away. At the very beginning of the Oxford movement, Newman had emphasized the importance of the imagination for apologetics. Research into the Church Fathers was crucial for developing, for developing or recovering a Catholic theology for the Church of England. But that was not, but that was not his only reason. He himself was, he wrote, poking into the Fathers with the hope of rummaging forth passages of history which may prepare the imaginations of his, in italics in the original the imaginations of men. This rummaging led to a series of letters on the Church of the Fathers in the British magazine, the first of which appeared in October 1833. They were republished in book form uh, as the Church of the Fathers. The idea was to put in front of people's imagination, imaginations the Church of the first centuries in order to show how very different the early Church was from both the established Church of England and Bible Protestantism. Later, Newman had the idea of starting out a series, a series of small volumes of prose and verse, which he hoped to get ladies to write for. The women were supposed to be very good at writing novels, but still the other from Jane Austen. Um, sorry. Um, yes, in order to counteract, sorry, he hoped these would be written to get ladies to write them, in order to counteract evangelical and Roman Catholic fiction. He wrote, we do want tales on our side very much to take people's imaginations. His own brother Frank, who would abandon Christianity, he thought would never become a Catholic, that is an Anglican Catholic, as he's writing as an Anglican, because of a great defect of imagination. In the Tamworth meeting room, there's a famous letters to the, no, no publishing division of any publisher would accept titles and list of Newman's books. It's a, it's a great work of satire. Newman famously insisted, with some exaggeration, that deductions have no power of persuasion. The heart is commonly reached, not through the reason, but through the imagination, by means of direct impressions, by the testimony of event, by the testimony of facts and events, by history, by description. Persons influence us, voices melt us, looks subdue us, deeds inflame us. Such being the power of the imagination, Newman was well aware that it could be used against, as well as for, religious faith. In one of his university sermons, he warns that the influence of the world, viewed as the enemy of our souls, consists in its hold upon our imagination, for it overcomes us by imposing on our imagination. It is ever ready to captivate our imaginations. It assails our imagination. It, it, it intoxicates the imagination of its miserable victims. In the idea of university, he points out, he points out that what may, be, what may easily seduce the imagination has no power to persuade the reason. Although in practice, the apparent inconsistency between reason and revelation can badly affect the imagination. Not that in reality, reason can deduce anything contrary to revelation, but nevertheless, the imagination is bewildered by what appears strange the imagination. 
In the grammar of assent, he accuses philosophers like Hume, who reject out of hand the possibility of miracles, of allowing their imagination to usurp the functions of reason, whereas imagination should follow the guidance of reason, should always be under the control of reason. Because he remarked in his philosophical notebook, religion is something supernatural, and because nature is closer to us, religion may easily be brought home to our imagination as unnatural. If the imagination refuses to listen to common sense, then only grace can subdue such an unhealthy imagination, since reason cannot do so, imagination being irrational. Imagination, he writes, is distinct from reason, although it can be mistaken for it. And the manner of truth, and the measure of truth for it is experience, with the result that what is strange, with the result that what is strange uh, to it is false. Consequently, Newman concludes, imagination not reason is the great enemy to faith. Thus, when Hume dismisses revealed religion as being against experience, he is really appealing to the imagination, not to the reason. Newman published four books, particularly, that contain imaginative apologetics, two novels, and two sets of lectures. His first novel, Loss and Gain, The Story of a Convert, published in 1848, was not even insisted, intended as a work of controversy in behalf of the Catholic religion. Uh, by this point, of course, he was a Roman Catholic. But rather, he claims it was a description of the course of thought and state of mind that leads someone to Catholicism. As he rightly pointed out, there was hardly any theological argument in the book. Doctrine is hardly touched upon. The novel's hero, Charles Reading, is an undergraduate who encounters at Oxford representatives of the various kinds of Anglicanism, evangelical, latitudinarian or liberal, Anglo-Catholic, and finds them all guilty of unreality and inconsistency. These intellectual rather than moral defects are Newman's usual targets as a satirist, there's only one place, and that is his attack on the defrocked the, the Milton Friar Achille, that Newman actually satirizes anybody's morals. It's always the inconsistency of the, of the reason and intellect that Newman satirizes. And a great deal of the novel of Watson Gay is taken up with satirizing, often very funnily, the conversation of these undergraduates and dons. But at the end of the novel, this kind of apologetic is replaced by a very different kind of apologetic, as we find reading at a Catholic service for the first time, waiting to be received into the church. <clears throat> the point that Newman wants to make is that Catholicism is essentially a different kind of religion from Anglicanism, a claim that appeals to the imagination rather than the intellect. For Catholicism is not simply Anglicanism plus a number of doctrines up for or against which theological arguments may be made. To make his point, the author has chosen for reading his first Catholic service, not the Mass, but benediction. And the reason is that whereas in benediction the congregation participated vocally, in the Tridentine Mass in Newman's day there was no vocal participation by the people, the altar server making the required responses, just as the clerk did in Anglican services. And I have to reading thought he had never been present at worship before, so absorbed was the attention, so intense was the devotion of the congregation. What particularly struck him was that whereas in the Church of England, the clergyman or the organ was everything and the people nothing, except so far as the clerk is their representative. Here it was just reversed. The priest hardly spoke, or at least audibly, but the whole congregation was as though the instrument of panharmonic, panharmonical, moving all together. And what was most remarkable, as if self-moved. They did not seem to require anyone to prompt or direct them, though in the litany, the choir took the alternate verses. The words were Latin, but everyone seemed to understand them thoroughly. Reading cannot but acknowledge this is a popular religion. When Newman started reading the Roman breviary, while he was still an Anglican, he was struck by the shortness of the prayers. Long prayers came in at the end of the Reformation. It's a very interesting point there, I think. Also, instead of long passages, passages of chapters that were short and broken portions. After he became a Catholic, Newman commented that the repetition of formularies, simple and familiar to all, will be found, I think, by experience to be practically the best means of securing prayer. And the union of prayer from masses of men 
litanies answer the same purpose. <clears throat> the same was true of the rosary, which Newman here has been, was reading here has been recited before the litany and benediction. It was rapid, alternate, and monotonous, and as it seemed, interminable. By contrast, the language of the Book of Common Prayer, that's the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, although it could be appreciated by the education, educated for its literary beauty, was hardly with its involved and lengthy cadences a suitable vehicle for popular worship. <clears throat> By contrast, reading can only wonder at a worship so different from Anglicanism and so classless. How wonderful, said Charles to himself, that people call this worship formal and external. It seems to possess it all classes, young and old, polished and vulgar. After the litany comes the blessing or benediction of the blessed sacrament, as reading suddenly realizes. It was a great presence which makes a Catholic church different from every other place in the world. As Willis, a fellow undergraduate who proceeds reading into the Catholic church observes, the idea of worship is different in the Catholic church from the idea of it in your church. For in, <coughs> for in truth, the religions, the religions are different. Catholic worship does not essentially consist in reading our words from book like the prayer book. He writes, he says, I could attend masses forever and not be tired. It is not a mere form of words. It is a great action, the greatest action that can be on earth. It is not the invocation merely, but the evocation of the eternal. He becomes present on the altar in flesh and blood, before whom angels bow and devils tremble. The Catholic Mass is a drama centered on an event that is equally accessible to all the worshippers. I quote, each in his place, with his own heart, with his own wants, with his own thoughts, with his own intention, with his own pr prayers, separate but concordant, watching what is going on, watching its progress, uniting in its consummation, not painfully and hopelessly following a hard form of prayer from beginning to end, but like a concert of musical instruments, each different, but concurring in a sweet harmony. Lost and Gain, then, concludes with the hero already disillusioned with the intellectual inconsistency and unreality of Anglicanism, encountering for the first time the concrete reality of Catholic worship. <coughs> um, sorry, um, Catholic worship so different from that of Anglicanism. The final appeal of Catholicism is not to his own intellect, but to his imagination. As reading watches the worshippers blessing themselves with holy water as they enter the church, lighting candles before the statues of the saints, waiting for confession, bowing down before the reserved sacrament, he experiences in effect, as Newman put in a letter, the atonement, the atonement of Christ, not as a thing to distance, or like the sun standing over against us and separated off from us, <clears throat> now feels surrounded by an atmosphere through which his warmth and light flow in upon us on every side. The contrast between reality and unreality is again the central theme of lectures on certain difficulties felt by Anglicans in submitting to the Catholic Church, and all of those uh, dreadful titles that every marketing division of every publishing house today would reject. <coughs> the Anglicans Newman's lectures were directed at were the Tractarians or Anglo-Catholics, whose ranks he had himself only left, he, or whose ranks he had, he had himself led only five years previously. <coughs> the, very first, the very first consideration that he presses upon them is the misuse of the imagination. He writes, we must not indulge our imagination. We must not dream. <coughs> we must not, we must look at things as they are. We must not indulge our imagination in the view we take of the national establishment. If indeed we dress it up in an ideal form, as if it were something real, as if it were indeed, and not only in name and church, then indeed we may feel interest in it and reverence towards it, and affection for it, as men have fallen in love with pictures, or knights in romance do battle for high dames whom they have never seen. This is, thus it is that students and fathers, antiquaries and poets, begin by assuming the body to which they belong is that of which they read in times past and then proceed to decorate it with that majesty and beauty of which history tells, or which their genius creates. <clears throat> he was speaking of himself here as a student of the fathers, who had once tried himself thus to imagine the Church of England, 
In his own case, though, the spell has been broken. But at length, he writes, either the force of circumstances or some unexpected uh, accident dissipates it. And as in fairy tales, <clears throat> the magic castle just vanishes when the spell is broken and nothing is seen but the wild heath, the barren rock, and the forlorn sheep walk. So it is with us as regards the Church of England. When we look in amazement on that we thought so unearthly and find so commonplace or worthless, Numerous four rank and friends are not very pleased with these lectures, needless to say. <clears throat> but because Newman says that we find that we have not been guided by reason, that does not mean that he rejects a positive role for imagination. Without the imagination, Newman himself might never have come a, become a Catholic, as he explains. Even when I was a boy, my thoughts were turned to the early church, and especially to the early fathers, by the perusal of the Calvinist Joseph Milner's church history. And I have never lost I never have suffered a suspension of the impression, deep and most pleasurable, which his sketches of St. Ambrose and St. Augustine left on my mind. From that time, the vision of the fathers was always, to my imagination, I may say, paradise of, de of delight. It's, it's paradoxical that Newman should have come discover the fathers uh, in this work uh, of a cat, in this history of by a Calvinist, who had a great influence upon him and was the essay, sowed the seeds for its conversion to Rome. <clears throat> Still, the object of the imagination must be real, and it is reason that determines this reality. <coughs> it is not the image of the early church that is a fantasy, but it is the imaginative effect, effort to identify this image with the Church of England that is fantastic. For the image is, in fact, the image of the Roman Catholic Church. And in the end, for Newman, it was the living hi picture which history presents to us, that opens his eyes to the identity of the image of the Church of the Fathers with that of the, with that of the Roman Catholic Church. As we have seen, the first premonition that this might be the reality that struck Newman was when his imagination seemed to see an extremely disquieting historical analogy. <clears throat> he describes in different his Anglicans, as he was to do in greater detail in the Apologia, how in 1839 his study of the Monophysite heresy and the Council of Chalcedon implanted a doubt in his mind as to a fundamental principle of Anglicanism, which never was eradicated. I thought I saw a clear interpretation of the present state of Christendom. In 1841, similarly, as he returned to the study of the Arian heresy and the Council of Trent, I'm sorry, uh, as he returned to the study of, um, sorry, something wrong here, brought before Newman's, <coughs> before Newman's eyes the same phenomenon. What Newman saw was a series of prototypes of the Anglican Via Media. I quote, When the Sea of Rome was then such as it is now, what Arius, Nestorius, or Eutyches were then, such are Luther and Calvin now. What the Eusebians on the Lotus sites then are then, are then, such are the Anglican hierarchy now. When the Byzantine called them, such is now the government of England. That ancient heresy is not dead, it lives. We see ourselves in it as in a glass, and if the Via Media was heretical, then it is heretical now. <clears throat> Newman concludes there was an awful similitude, more awful because so silent and unimpassioned, between the dead records of the past and the feverish chronicle of the present. An analogy like, this, like that has to be seen by the imagination, and Newman admits that he did not know how to convey this to others in one or two paragraphs. Again, it was the imagination as such, as much as the reason, that saw an analogy between the development of doctrine in the early church and that in the modern Roman Catholic Church. The force of this, to me, ineffably cogent argument, I cannot hope to convey to another. The imaginative argument from analogy is crucial to Newman's charge against Anglican Catholicism, for it is through the imaginative recognition of analogies that realities are revealed. Thus, Newman allows that the fathers have Catholicized the Protestant Church at home, but only preaches pretty much as the Bible has evangelized the Mohammedan or Hindu religions abroad. For just as the Turks would feel serious resentment at hearing the gospel in the mouths of their muftis and mullahs, so, so was it, it is, the English nation provoked not persuaded by Catholic preaching in the establishment. Or again, if Anglo-Catholics were to argue from the sensible effects of supernatural grace 
that they are part of the Catholic Church, then what Newman unkindly asked is to be said of Methodists, who display more remarkably phenomena in their history, symptomatic of the presence of grace among them, than you can show in yours. Then the charge that the Roman Catholic Church does not in fact enjoy any more real unity than the Church of England, as shown, for example, by the widespread Jansenist heresy, lasting nearly 200 years, is a charge as easily leveled at the early Church, infected from within by the Monophysite heresy, which lasted for between 400 and 500 years. As for the mere presence of rival Christian bodies, this phenomenon is but one, one instance of a great and broad fact that truth as opposed, is opposed not only by direct contradictions which are unequivocal, but also such pretenses are as of a character to deceive men at first sight. The false prophets in the Old Testament illustrate this, and so from the beginning the church was but one communion among many which bore the name of Christian. None of them more learned, some of them more learned, and others affecting greater strictness than herself. Hence the famous advice of the fathers that if one of the faithful went to a strange city, she would not ask for the church, but for the Catholic Church. Unlike the modern Orthodox churches, some of the early heretical bodies actually rival the Catholic Church in their universality. As for the alleged Roman Catholic divergence from the patristic church, are not Anglicans to give account for their own serious departure in so many respects from the true and primitive doctrine and ritual. Imagination as well as reason is required to see such analogies. Just as without the judgment of reason, the imagination can be overwhelmed by the sight of so many nations and races which have kept the name of Christian, yet given up Catholicism, or by the number, power, and nobleness of the Orthodox. <clears throat> The restoration of the English Catholic hierarchy in 1850 and the elevation of Bishop Nicholas Wiseman to the Cardinalate led to a violent agitation against this so-called papal aggression that was only exacerbated by the triumphalist pastoral letter that Wiseman saw fit to issue. The following year, Newman delivered a series of public lectures published, again a terrible title, published as lectures on the present position of Catholics in England in which he confronted, and really for the first time in English history, he confronted traditional English anti-Catholicism or anti popery His aim was to show that the ingrained prejudice was founded not on reason, but on imagination. And I quote, scandalous stories circulated against Catholics may be proved to have no basis in fact, and yet an impression has been created or deepened that a monk commits murder or adultery as readily as he eats his dinner. It is because Catholicism appeals to the imagination as a great fact whenever she comes that Protestantism has to impress upon the popular imagination that the Catholic Church is the Antichrist. Such impressions do not depend afterwards upon the facts or reasoning by which they are produced. They were produced any more than a blow when at once given has any connected connection with the stone, the stone or the stick which gave it. The anti-Catholic prejudice simply remains as the stain on the mind. However, an image that has stained the Protestant imagination may use to be used against Protestantism itself. That it is not a Catholic country, but Protestant England itself, which as far as religion is concerned, really must be called one large convent, or rather workhouse. The old pictures hang on the walls. The worldwide church is ch chalked up on every side as a wyvern or griffin. No pure gleam of light finds its way in or from within. A thick atmosphere refracts and distorts such struggling rays as get admittance. In order to ridicule the anti popery tradition, or no popery tradition, Newman deploys the most startling and vivid imagery to be found in any of his writings. Faced with apparently unassailable national prejudice that confronts both the reason and imagination, he demands to know how it is we are cried out against by the very stones and bricks and tiles and chimney pots. The truth is the Protestant tradition left to itself would in the course of time languish and decline. But for the established church, for which no form of opinion can, comes amiss, but Rome it cannot abide. Its special duty therefore is not to inculcate any particular theological system, 
but to watch over the anti-Catholic tradition, to preserve it from rust and decay, to keep it bright and keen and ready for action on any emergency or peril. It is principally concerned with cataloguing and classing the texts which are to batter us and the objections which are to explode among us and the institutions and the insinuations and the slanders which are to mow us down. It is a special mission of the established church to be the keeper of an ordinary <coughs> of those national types and blocks from which popery is ever to be printed off. Its success lies in producing the prejudiced English Protestant, who, like a man who has been for a long while in one position, is cramped and disabled, and has a difficulty in pain in stretching his limbs, straightening them, and moving them freely. In his view, the Catholic Church ought to be content with vegetating as a sickly plant in some backyard or garret window. He, for his part, is intensely conscious that he is in a very eligible situation and his opponent in the gutter, and he lectures down upon him as if I were drawing the window. Uh, so industrious is the anti-Catholic tradition that it can manufacture products more lasting than those of industrial Birmingham, where, of course, we were living and working at the time he wrote this. The meetings and preachings which are ever going on against us on all sides, though they may have no argumentative force, whatever, are still immense factories for the creation of prejudice. An article by means of these uh, exertions more carefully elaborated and more lasting in its nature than any specimen of hardware or other industrial products which are the boast of a town such as this. Catholic attempts to respond to Protestant prejudice are doomed from the full start. I quote, if for instance a person cannot open the door or get a key into a lock which has done a hundred times before. You know how apt it is to shake and to rattle and to force it, as if some great insult was offered him by its resistance. You know how surprised a wasp or other large insect is that he cannot get through a window pane. Such is the feeling of the prejudiced man when we urge our rejections, not softened by them at all, but exasperated them all. When faced with conversions to Catholicism, the prejudiced man has a last resort he simply forgets that Protestants they ever were. They emerge from the great fog in which, to his eyes, everything Catholic is invoked. They are dwellers in the land of romance and fable, and if he dimly contemplates them, plunging and floundering them in the gloom, it is as, as griffins, wyverns, salamanders, <coughs> and small popery, such as are said to sport in the depths of the sea or to range among the central sands of Africa. <coughs> Catholic efforts to be conciliatory are hopeless, for our advances are meant as would be those of some hideous baboon, or, or, or sloth, or rattlesnake, or toad, which strove to make itself agreeable. As for Catholic beliefs, they are as likely to gain admittance into the Protestant imagination as for a lighted candle to remain burning when dipped into a vessel of water. When Catholic doctrines are referred to, they stand in Reformation tracks, torn up by the roots, or planted down headwards, head downwards, not as they are found in our own garden, but in any case they are too great, great to be comfortably to be comfortably accommodated in a Protestant nutshell. For just as Protestantism has its scripture texts, so too it has its chips, shavings, brick bats, potherds, and other odds and ends of the heavenly city, which form the authenticated and, tic and ticketed specimen of what the Catholic Church of what the Catholic religion uh, is in its great national museum. Similarly, Protestants prefer to keep at a convenient distance from us, to take the angles, calculate the sines and cosines, and work out an algebraic process when common sense would bid them ask us a few questions. It is then because Catholics are to be surveyed from without and not inspected from within, that texts and formulas are to prevail over broad and luminous facts, and one grain of Protestant logic is to weigh more than cartloads of Catholic testimony. As for any personal knowledge, did the deeds come down from some old piece of tapestry, or were allowed rampant from an indoor suddenly to walk the streets? A Protestant would not be more surprised than at the notion that we have nerves, that we have hearts, that we have sensibilities. 
Indeed, they will do all in their power not to see you. The nearer you come, they will close their eyelids all the tighter. They will be very angry and frightened and give the alarm as if you were going to murder them. So powerful, so all-consuming is anti-Catholicism that if Catholicism were taken to the market, then scandal would be out its staple food and its cheap luxuries, while Protestant Christians could not fast for a day, would be in torment inexplicable and call it popish persecution to be kept on this sort of meager for a Lent. I would shake down Queen and Parliament with the violence of its convulsions, rather than that it rather than that it should never suck a Catholic sweet burdens and drink his blood anymore. In fact, prejudice is ever craving for food. Vittles are in constant request for its consumption every day, and accordingly they are served up in unceasing succession. Titus Oates, Maria Monk, and Jeffreys being the purveyors of the platform, and pulpits speakers being the cooks. Protestantism being the current coin of the realm, there is an incessant, unwearied circulation of Protestantism all over the country for 365 days in the year from morning to night. Converts to Catholicism constantly present a strange phenomenon to the great Protestant tradition of anti-Catholicism, whose champions therefore are advised by Newman to be sure to shoot your game sitting, keep yourselves under cover, and from there open your wide mouth, and collect your rumbling epithets, and round your pretentious sentences, and discharge your concentrated malignity. As in difficulties of Anglicans, analogies are deployed to gain admittance into the Protestant imagination. Thus there is a comic account of an apparent indictment of the British Constitution by a, by a Russian count who has never actually seen or visited England or studied its history, but who has dipped into Blackstone and several English writers and has picked up facts at third or fourth hand and has got together a crude, a, a crude <coughs> of ideas, words, and instances, a little truth, a deal of falsehood, a deal of misrepresentation, <clears throat> um, a deal of nonsense, and a deal of invention. The resulting picture is so absurd a caricature, just like the caricature which the Protestant no popery tradition has impressed on the English imagination. It has become, for example, familiar to an Englishman to wonder at and to pity the recluse and the devotee who surround themselves with a high enclosure and cut out what is on the other side. But was there ever such an instant, instance of self-sufficient, dense, and ridiculous bigotry as that which rises up and walls in the minds of our fellow countrymen from all knowledge of one of the most remarkable phenomena, phenomena which the history of the world has seen? Surely it is extraordinary that in an inquisitive age when the Alps are crested and seas fathomed and mines ransacked, and sands sifted, and rocks cracked into specimens, and beasts caught in catalog. As little is known by Englishmen of the religious sentiments, the religious usages, the religious motives, the religious ideas of 200 millions of Christians poured to and fro among them as around them. As if I would not say they were Tartars or Patagonians, but as if, but as if they uh, inhabited the moon. And so the English Protestant who despises the enclosed monk or nun turns out, <coughs> turn out to be, turns out to be as enclosed himself, while in spite of his boasted knowledge of the world, he's wholly ignorant of Catholics, about whom he has so much to say. Newman presses home the assault on the Protestant imagination by enlisting analogy after analogy. Why is it all right for Irish Protestants to venerate a statue of William of Orange, but not a crucifix? Protestants object to images in Catholic churches, and yet they're quite happy to burn the Pope in effigy, as of course it is or was traditionally done on the 5th of November, Guy Fawkes Day. <coughs> Protestants are scandalized by Catholic references to the omnipotence of the Virgin Mary, but they're quite happy to speak about the omnipotence of Parliament. Just as Protestants understand that the notice ring the bell presupposes if you have better business within, so Catholics understand that indulgences, indulgences presuppose, but do not convey sacramental absolution. Protestants object to the Catholic emphasis on tradition, but on what does anti-Catholicism rest except tradition, immemorial, unauthenticated tradition? 
Protestants value freedom of thought, but towards us they do not dream of practicing it. And why should they object to Protestants, who use their private judgment to become Catholics? The original reformer, reformers used their private judgment against the church. But was there enough private, but there was enough of private judgment in, they thought, in the world, they thought, when they had opened and imposed on the populations they had reformed an artificial tradition of their own, instead of the liberty of inquiry and disputation. Lectures on the present position of Catholics in England is certainly not a work of apologetics in the normal sense. It is not an attempt to offer a theological response to Protestant objections to Catholicism, but it can rightly, as a masterpiece of satire, be called apologetic in an imaginative sense. I think there are passages in um, lectures on the present position of Catholics which are much funnier than anything you find in Swift. Uh, but the uh, typical <coughs> English department in Britain, which I was once a member, uh, has never heard of the book. They don't know it's one of the great works of satire in the English language. In the summer of 1873, at the opening of a new seminary near Birmingham, Newman warned the seminarians that the trials that lie before us are such as would appall and make dizzy even such courageous hearts as St. Athanasius, St. Gregory the First, or St. Gregory the Seventh. And they would confess the dark as the prospect of their own day was to them suddenly. Ours has a different, has a diff darkness different in kind from any that has been before it. The phenomenon, of course, that Newman was referred to is what today we would call secularization. Christianity had never yet had experience of a world simply irreligious till the 19th century. The church had plenty of experience of dealing with pagans, the modern world where the supernatural seemed to have disappeared from human consciousness. It would be natural to assume that Newman, recommend, that Newman would recommend the Christian apologist to approach the secular post-Christian with the argument from conscience, his famous argument. After all, in the grammar of ascent, he had called conscience the great internal teacher of religion. It was a great teacher because it was a personal guide, and I use it because I must use myself, and because therefore it was nearer to me than any other means of knowledge. And if he had to prove the being of a God, it was in conscience that he would look for the proof of it. I quote, as from a multitude of instinctive perceptions, of something beyond the senses, we generalize the notion of an internal world, of an external world, and then picture that world in and through. And according to those particular phenomena from which we started, so from the perceptive power which identifies intimations of conscience with the reverberations or echoes, so to say, of an external admonition, we proceed on to the notion of a supreme being and judge, and then again we image him and his attributes in those recurring intimations, out of which as mental phenomena our existence of his origin of his existence was originally was originally gained. And it's the same argument of course that Newman uses uh, in the apologetic Revita Sura. It is then remarkable, it seems to me, that in the one work where Newman depicts a conversion to Christianity, conscience plays no role at all, actually. The heroine of his novel Callista is a Greek pagan, or rather post-pagan girl, who with her brother Aristo has come to Sicca in North Africa to work as artist for a merchant called Eucundus, who is warmly attached to the reigning paganism, and who drove a thriving trade in idols, large and small amulets and the like. However, neither brother nor sister had any special attachment to paganism or to any other religion. Indeed, Callista sounds very like the typical Victorian who has lost their faith, the typical post-Christian. In Greece, she had worshipped Apollo, the god of light and the sun. Um, and she goes, goes on to say, I think, skip. Uh, a keen worship of Apollo. Um, but somehow, I worship nothing now. I am weary. Feeling a weariness in all things, Callisto would have had some understanding of how Matthew Arnold felt when he spoke of the melancholy long withdrawal, uh, the long, sorry, the melancholy long withdrawing roar of the sea of faith in that famous poem of it. Callista has a suitor, a genius, the nephew of Euclidus, who was baptized as a small boy. He has retained his faith, but there's no chance of practicing it properly, as the church had virtually ceased to exist in Sicca. Callista had has had contact with Christianity through a slave of hers called Keone, who exemplifies the importance of what Newman called 
personal influence in evangelizing. Um, now, instead of using the argument for conscience, as I say, uh, conscience is not the issue, but something quite different for the conversion of the post pagan Callista. I quote, here I am a living, breathing woman with an overflowing heart, with keen affections, with a yearning after some object which may possess me. I cannot exist with something without something to rest upon. I cannot fall back upon that drear, full, forlorn state. That drear, forlorn state, which philosophers call wisdom and moralists call virtue. I must have something to love. Love is my life. You throw me back upon my dreary, dismal self. Well, Callista meets this priest called Cecilius, who is probably meant to be uh, Saint, uh, Saint Cyprian. And she objects to the Christian, she says she's attracted by Christianity, but objects to the doctrine, objects to the doctrine of hell. Cecilius asks her to imagine how she will feel as the years go by. At the end of 200 years, you'll be too miserable, even for your worst enemy, to rejoice in it. In fact, though she will die, perhaps you will tell me that you will never cease to be. I don't believe you think so. I may take for granted that you think with me and with a multitude of men that you will still live, that you will still be you. You will be still the same being, but deprived of the outward stays and reliefs and solaces, which such as they are you now enjoy. You will be yourself, shut up in yourself. Chetilius then argues that since the soul always needs external objects to rest upon, and since it has no prospect of any such when it leaves this visible scene, then there is nothing irrational in the notion of the eternal Tartarus, the hunger, and the thirst, and the gnawing of heart, of the heart will be as keen and piercing as the flame. And then Cecilius uh, proceeds to challenge her imagination to respond to the case of Christianity, which he presents as offering, precisely as offering liberation from the prison of the self. If you have needs, desires, aims, and aspirations, all of which demand an object, and imply by their very existence that such an object does exist, and if nothing here does satisfy them, and if there be a message which professes to come from that object, of whom will you already have the presentment, and to teach you about it, and to bring the remedy you crave, and if those who try that remedy say with one voice that the remedy answers, are you not bound, Twister, at least to look that way? Um, and so the argument is not to come from conscience, but it's, but it's, seen, but it's presented to Callista by Cecilius as a responsible as a response to secular man's sense of unfulfillment and desire for happiness. And then, then Callista receives to and Callista becomes aware of the incarnation. The image of God who has come in human form in his own world to win it back sinks deeply into Callista's imagination. Is this the, um, so I can skip that, I can running really out of time. What impressed her was that all three Christians she had met had made, it, had made Christianity to consist in the intimate divine presence in the heart. It was a friendship or mutual love of person with person, core ad core locator, to quote Newman's motto. So, to begin with anyway, conscience plays no role at all in the conversion of the post-pagan uh, Callista. And then the image of Christ becomes much clearer, and so she starts, she begins reading the Gospels. So I think it's very interesting. I think Newman's, I'm going to stop now, but to find me, Newman's, um, I think what Newman would tell us, those of us who are Christians, how to approach the secular, <coughs> secular human being or secular neighbor is to make them aware of their own unhappiness. You will not, you will not say that to waver, to say to them, repent, you are a sinner, but would have no false at all, and it doesn't. But rather to say to them, the truth is you're unhappy, aren't you? And there is a, there is a remedy which we can offer you. Why don't you try it? Why don't you look at it? I think that's what Newman would say uh, to the Christian in today's secular life world. Thank you very much.
Uh, well, yes, I think we have an idea that it was further to um, the translation into, into the vernacular, into the lang uh, vernacular language. But what I think they would be appalled by in the post-Vatican II Church, which I'm also appalled by, and that is the, um, the way the Blessed Sacrament in many churches has been pushed into the St. Doris corner, you know, not prominently displayed. Because that was the thing that really struck Newman when he, see, when you have to understand, when Newman became a Catholic, he really knew very little about Catholicism. I mean, he knew about Catholic doctrine, yes, of course he did. But he didn't know about the actual practice of it. And he didn't, he didn't understand. It was the, the fact that when he encountered, he was told, that they have to have an apple. There is, Jesus Christ is in there. This struck his imagination most forcibly. He says far more about that than he does about the Mass. And he goes to Milan um, in 1846 on his way to, <laughs> to study, if you can call it that, at the College of Propaganda in Rome, where he used to fall asleep in the lectures. <laughs> of course, it's a third rate place. While his own book, The Essay on Development of Christian Doctrine, was being lectured on in the Collegio Romano, the, what now, the Gregorian University. So there was Newman, the student at the, at the worst university in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> this book has been lectured upon the best universities, a great paradox. Um, but but uh, he, he's on his way, he goes to Milan, and he's absolutely struck by the fact that it's late summer, early autumn, late summer, and the church doors are all open, and he sees this lamp flickering. And he says, now I understand what Catholicism is all about. It was the, the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, the reserved sacrament. And as I say, since Vatican II, there has been, fortunately now, the Eucharistic adoration is coming back into the church in quite a big way. But certainly in the years immediately after the Council, the Eucharistic adoration was considered to be well, quasi heretical. You know, the, the, the liturgy was everything. And there was very willing to be doing the kind of Well, thank God that has changed or has changed. So I think that was what Newman would deplore most of all. I think it would be very sad too that benediction is so rarely seen. I think I'd like to see a recovery of benediction. Which again, of course, is, is a reminder of the Blessed Sacrament, that the sacrament has been reserved and we're being blessed by it. It's a great shame that that, because that, of course, used to be standard in, on Sunday evenings in Catholic churches with the litany of the saints. But I mentioned the litanies in a book I published some years ago called The Catholic Revival in English Literature. I argued that in, in my in chapter of Hopkins, I argued that the litany had, had, a, big, had a big influence on it. Um, the um, litanies were the only things the Jesuits did in common. After Vatican II, they got rid of them. So now they don't have any worship in common, unless they can celebrate Mass. Uh, but the, the, the litanies were imposed upon all Jesuits by the Second General, by St. Ignatius Loyola's successor. We have a Jesuit who can confirm this. Uh, and uh, one of Hopkins' poems is, is in the form of a litany, the poem on Duns Scotus. It's precisely in the form of a litany. Every old Catholics knew about this in these days. Now they hardly know about the at all. I think it was an influence of by um, what's his name, um, Charles Kingsley's book Hypatia, mm -hmm. which is again set in well, as a fourth century Alexandria, third century Alexandria, and he wanted to write. He was asked to, right, to uh, well, Cardinal Wiseman wrote a novel called Fabiola, which was again, uh, sort of, it was again a Catholic attempt to confront Kingsley. So I think there's no doubt that Newman too had that in mind when he wrote the novel Callisto. Again, this was to be a work of fiction that would confront, um, confront Kingsley's novel Hypatia. How whom Newman, Newman never lost his sense of humor, even the darkest of hours. This is, I think I was saying yesterday, the biography of, by Wilfred Ward had, had a great influence on poor people. And it was good on Newman's theology because it was written at a time when there was a threat that Newman might be condemned as a modernist by Pope St. Pius X, or by Rome. Um, and so he, he gives a very good account of how um, Newman's theology that, that he was. You know, that and, and, and points out how orthodox it is. But unfortunately, Ward presented this picture of a rather gloomy, hypersensitive Newman, which had a great influence. It influenced, I think I mentioned yesterday, the fact that the English bishops years ago in their ignorance asked Rome to make 
people who adopted the church not a saint. So they didn't believe he was a saint, you see, because they, they read Wolfram Wall's biography. Um, but the truth is, Newman was certainly very sensitive, no doubt, at times. He was only sensitive, just as a generous person is liable at times to be indulgent, or a brave man is, and, and is, is tempted at times to be, uh, to be rash. So no, I, don't, I wouldn't deny that sometimes Newman was, was over sensitive, not at all. But the idea that he was some sort of gloomy, hypersensitive creature, you know, is absolutely ridiculous. And he, he was very, very funny. Well, you saw lectures in prison, prison of Prison Catholics and all. It's, well, it's a very fun, it's a great work of satire. As I say, no one in any English department has ever heard of it. But I think it's much funnier than Swift's modest proposal, for example. Uh, well, our conversation doesn't have to end here. We have uh, a wine and cheese reception uh, just outside the door there, um, as well as uh, Father Carr's biography of Newman available for purchase um, from the seminary co-op. And I trust that he might be over generous and be willing to sign the copies for you if you decide to purchase them tonight. I won't charge. <laughs> 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 <laughs>